tell me a little bit about your background because you were a you were a practicing financial advisor, certified financial planner for tell me about that course of history. And when did you get started in that? And what was your practice like? I got started in finance because I was a finance major as an undergrad. And okay. when ta- when I gradu- graduated, I was not interested in big finance at all. And financial planning had just started up. I was interested in people. And that made me get into the field. And it took a while because... You got to get to CFP. You have to work in the industry. And then I went to grad school at Babson and wrote my business plan for my business before starting it in Boston 30 years ago. And I worked with individual clients and I loved it for 25 years. And on the side, I was speaking and writing. And that's where my heart is. I want to educate other financial planners with the experience of the intersection between psychology and money. And I, because I like people and I wanted to write more and I was doing both of those, but not enough. So in 2019, I sold my book of business and decided I'd go on the road speaking and writing. We know I got sidetracked because of that little thing, COVID, (laughs) But uh, that did that put put a dent in big public events, didn't it? <laughs> it? It certainly did. But it gave me more opportunity to write and refine a lot of my work. And now I'm getting back on the road again and hoping to educate individuals as well as other planners, because you have lived through it. And we need to tell the planners to keep their eye open for situations of money and memory issues. So I want to talk about money, memory, money and memory issues. The I think I wanted to ask you though first, just some of your thoughts and some of your work around the psychology of money. And I know that that's that's been a, a big part of, that you've certainly written about that. And and maybe coming at peace with money. I, I think of we've had a few psychologists here that that are that that talk about that i know you're not necessarily a psychologist but you've practiced this yes and i wonder if th- there's just so many things around money and money anxiety and the fear of running out of money and then you've got you think about the the up the upping of negative words in headlines i we you've probably i don't know if you've read about this but if you, if you track headlines over the last 20 years, the propensity for sadness and fear and shock have gone up by 300% in headlines. So we're all a little more on edge. And it just makes, even though we have way more information and almost full democratized information in the United States, it, it probably makes it even harder from a money perspective to be an investor. So I, I guess I wanted your thoughts around how you coached people over time on that side of the the, of the well, ledger. on that side of the equation, and I, I tread lightly here, but social media and media on television, they're designed to be, have shock value and do have leads that are going to catch your attention. So in a business of 25 years, I, I went through many ups and downs with clients in the financial markets. And often I would tell them, turn off the news or don't open your statements. You can open them and look at them once a year. So you have to streamline that information that's out there. There is a whole wealth of information out there, which is great. And we need to know that then objective advice is even more important now. So having someone learn how to decipher the financial information is as important as the information itself, knowing where it came from. So how, so what was the biggest challenge? So you, you, you've, yeah, when it, when it came to clients and them being good investors over time, what was the, what do you, what did you see as the biggest roadblock to that? The biggest roadblock was getting them to acknowledge where their fears or their hesitations were coming from because often they were coming from their family, not really looking at the $50,000, $200,000 that they have invested. I had one client 
who came in and they were terrified of everything going on because they didn't have enough money. They bought me a list of their assets. Obviously, it was a first time client. It was written on a little piece of note paper this big. And they had over a million dollars in assets. Spread out in a bunch of different cash and stocks kind of all over the place. But think what credit they gave it that it was on a three and a half by five piece of paper. They just couldn't even look at it because they just felt so poor to begin with that this wasn't anything of value. So we had to go do the deeper dive in conjunction with this. Some of my clients used to call me a financial therapist but I always did the work of the kind of therapy steps with the finances. I never, for, for example, so yeah. what are some of the, yeah, give me some examples around this. It's, it's, the first and greatest thing that I, I like talking to people about, well, first talking to people, clients come in, whether they have a little piece of paper or notebooks full of their financial information, I'd say, put that down. I'm going to talk to you. And I'm sure just, by your way in the pot doing the podcast, you do the same thing. I need to talk to you. And I talk about what's their values, what's their priorities. And then I would go around the block some and say, now tell me about how you grew up and learning what their history was with money within their family, or perhaps they had a previous marriage. Then what, what was that like? That sets up where they're at today. So no Mm. matter how much money they have, no matter how little debt they had, they were stuck in a behavior pattern from the past. And then we did steps to get out of that. So the and I guess the and Mor- Morgan Housel talks about this in his book that he's I think his first lesson around psychology of money is that nobody's crazy because that because everyone's their financial opinions are rooted in however they grew up. It's whatever and, and that is an almost an endless fingerprint that is unique to everybody, right? It's the timing, the family wealth, the family, uh, the way the family spend, the 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 hardships or 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 non-hardships that families went through. So everybody kind of has this unique DNA around how they think about money. In the birth order. So, and, oh, and well, what do you think about birth order? That's I, I don't know. If I I'm, haven't. Exa- tell me birth order. A personal example. Okay. So I have two older sisters, and then I have a brother who is two years older than me. So it makes those sisters significantly older in many ways. They're eight and six years older, all from the same parents. By by the way, my mother used to have to explain that. However, my brother and I were young when my father's business turned more successful. So we went to Disney World three times. We went to, you know, Florida with my parents. My sisters went to um, outside Boston, Brent Rock, for a month. And I probably did too. I don't really remember. Not a month, two or three weeks. But with my mother's extended family who had all chipped in to buy this place. Like, so my sister's perception of money and how they grew up is very different than my brother and I, even though we lived under the same roof our entire lives. What was opportunities for us was different. So who are the, in your, so it's not necessarily birth order as in the oldest thinks this way, the youngest thinks this way. You're saying the birth order in relation to how each one grew up economically. In our situation, but also birth order because who's responsible? You know, the oldest is the most responsible, typically in a family, Mm -hmm. and the youngest is more fly by night. I can think of another family where the older kids were always given the youngest one extra money in college and different places because they had no money. So who does that make you, you know? Yeah. So what, okay. So, so what it was it, so who was the, who became in your family, in your, in your birth order, who were the risk? risk, I don't know if we could categorize it into more willing to take risk versus more conservative with money in general. Who was who? My older sister would be the uh, most conservative. 
I'm sure that was part her personality, but I think birth order had some to do with it and what she experienced. I got to look out for other people. I, I'm taking in more of what's going on in the family dynamics. And then my brother and I are probably more risk takers when it comes to money. Well, you started your own business right out of school, for God's sake. I, say, I mean, that's that's like the ultimate. That's the that's a riskier move than being an all stock well, investor. Let's go back like, to the psychology of entrepreneurship. My dad had his own business, so business owners are more successful when they see someone else up close and personal run a business. Yeah, I will. I will tell you, me growing up with my dad as a veterinarian but he had his own practice. And I remember there's so vivid, the, the few moments that how that trajectory changed. He was working for a, he, he was, I don't think he was a partner with the, the vet he worked for when he got out of kind of his first steady long-term veterinary job. And, but I still remember it was Dr. Cowan was the guy who, that, that he worked with. And my dad was young. Now looking back on it, he was pretty young. And I think it, in his early 30s, Dr. Cowan had kind of gotten old enough to say he was ready to go and he had some health issues and he offered to sell the practice to my dad. And boom, I remember that conversation. I was I was probably, I don't know, 10 and or were nine you the or oldest? eight. Yeah, I'm the oldest. So I remember, remember when he said, gosh, it's a, you know, it's it costs a lot of money, but I'm going to, I'm going to own the practice. And then I saw him from age 10 all the way till, till he sold it about right before COVID make that journey. And I was, you know, in the office, I was helping cleaning kennels. And I remember I mean, he would always talk about the, the, the personnel and it's so hard to find doctors. And it was like this, this, this tech was great. And this one was not great. And they had to fire this one and hire. So my whole growing up from like age eight, until really forever was all about the business that he ran. And it was the, his entire, my entire conversation with him were all those years. So much of it was around that. And then I, I ended up really doing the exact, almost the exact same thing. When I was 31 is when I left a bit, a big brokerage firm and partnered with who, who would, would to, today to this day be my existing partners. And we have a, you know, we have a business. We have a, we have and, an RIA. So it applies on money and, and risk. And it would be interesting if you have siblings to talk to them to see how much they got and all that, because sometimes everyone hears it and sometimes the younger ones don't. Yeah. I think my youngest siblings, they went less entrepreneurial, more, more medicine. Right. So they, I, I don't know what that, but I, I, but it is very interesting. I think it is a great question to just say, look, how did you grow up? And, and you talk about money about in that journey of growing up and it really does tell, it informs us what our kind of our money anchors are and how we really think about it. So, and then give me an example of, of overcoming something. Is it Mostly overcoming over over conservatism, where somebody says, "Oh, I just I don't want to invest in stocks; they're too risky." No, what, what do you think it is? It's not always about investing; it's adjusting to what they have if they have money, or adjusting to what they don't have if they don't have money. Mm. So that's where I merge the two, because I don't have a lot of psychology background, but I have a lot of people skills from mm -hmm. doing that. And I would say, instead of saying someone in debt, oh, you have to save, you know, $500 a month, or you're going to never be able to retire. I would say, hey, it looks like you're spending $500 a month on your credit card. Why don't we try 300 for a month mm -hmm. and back that down? So if they're overspenders, it isn't about pointing the finger. It's knowing their background that an emotional state that they feel like they have the money to spend when we know they don't. And vice versa, I had a client that there were actually two siblings operating totally differently. One was very similar to that. The other one, they had both inherited money from their mother. The other one would not spend a penny. Mm. That was money was going to be for retirement. There was nothing that she could possibly do. She was working a full-time job. She had enough to retire, but she was working full-time. And I actually made her go out 
didn't spend $20 a week on something foolish until she met me again. <laughs> That's kind of fun. It was really a fun assignment, but it shows how individual people are. By the way, what happened? Did it work or what, well, what, did it, what happened? The first time she was like, oh, I didn't do it. We had met two weeks. The, way. the next time she came, she had bought, bought a pretty um, scarf. And she had bought some food she wouldn't have bought. So I was, I was like, good. It's just practice. That's all any of us. We need practice. It's a human skill is money. And merging these two is so important to me. And that's why I love doing the speaking to other planners because I can give them tips and tools and say, here's the actual well, steps to make it work rather than just the psychology big overview, which is important. But we need to know how to apply it. Uh, so one, go out and spend something foolish. That's kind of interesting. How do you? How have you seen? Have you had to core? I'm sure you have over over your career. Course correct somebody who was. Let's let's maybe think about how they think about investing. Either either overly conservative or overly aggressive. Have you been able to? Of course, correct that. Well, well, one, I, you know, if you could go back to remembering this, in after two thousand, when the stock market went down drastically, I had a rush of clients because mm. of uh, because they were all invested too aggressively. So when the market went down, they went way down. But they thought the market was going to last forever at twenty percent a year. Yeah. So those kind of course corrections. Are very easy, as you know, because yeah. they're learning from them their mistakes, and they're yeah. probably doing it independently. If someone's too conservative, it's more of making sure they have enough cash, and probably too much cash by some people, and then say, now the rest of this is long term. Yeah, and really trying to get them to understand that it's okay as long as you have, let's call it your dry powder, you've got a year or two, five years, whatever it might be that we know has a high degree of safety. Now let's really focus on building wealth with this re- this remaining amount. You get it, Wes. This is the important thing to say, this is for the long term. In the long term, people think they're going to retire. And I love the idea of retiring sooner, but they think they're going to retire when they turn 58 and need all their money. So I we need to really talk about with them adjusting their expectation that you're going to need that money for 30, 40 years after that. How about the fear? The I I feel like I I talk about this a lot with families that that I I work with. I I'm thinking of a family I just talked to this week that is the the wife has been saying she's going to retire since she was 64. Mm-hmm. And she was like, this is the year I'm done. She works at a big, one of these giant U.S., let's call it a telecom company. And uh, doesn't he, didn't, didn't really like the work. They already had enough money to, to retire. But she, so then it was like, the, well, maybe I'm not going to do this year. I'm going to do it next year. I'm on a project. So next year. So she went a whole nother year. And then here we were. Now she's 66 going into 67. This is the year she's going to retire and still didn't pull the trigger. And it's not literally until this week that she is now 70 and she now is taking, now she's just social security starting literally this coming month for her because she kind of has, she has to take Mm -hmm. it at this point. She's waited this long and has finally pried herself away from, by the way, a job that she didn't really even like all that much. Now she did get some purpose from it. She liked being a, higher level executive or man, high level manager slash executive, but she just could not and for a variety of reasons could not stop. And her husband for years, literally five, six years was, was kind of persuading her and asking me to help persuade her. Hey, she knows she, she knows she can, let's go through the numbers, but she just couldn't do it. So there is this, and she will say that Beyond the purpose she got from her work and the a little bit of interaction, a lot of it is remote, so it's not like that much social interaction, which I think is is a key, is important to hang on to. But really, just the fear of not having a paycheck that just seems to be a, a very real. That's a very real hurdle for almost everybody I talk to, kind of no matter how much money they they have, no matter how much money they have or what career they're in. Because I had a doctor who 
just replace the situation. He was a doctor, the same issue. I had another client who had inherited money and could retire. And she, for her, I'm sure you've had conversations with these people because often I try and pull out, who do you know who has retired? Who can you talk to? What was your parents' retirement like? So there's something underlying that fear of lack of paycheck. And who are you hanging around with? Because sometimes some people are more like, oh, I can't retire and um, because I won't have a paycheck or I won't have insurance. But the one I really am most proud of is a cl client who was a nurse. So she was on her feet all week long and she had money to retire and just didn't want to retire. She just was like, I can't. I do. And so I said, hey, you know, you talk about your grandchildren a lot. Let's take, um, I think it was like $200 a month out of your retirement. And some of it wasn't in a trust. Where it came from is irrelevant, but it was her retirement money to treat your grandchildren once a month. So first we did $200. Then I said, Hey, I bet you could work four days a week. She said, oh yeah, I could. I said, how about if we took $1,000 out and replaced that paycheck until we kind of got her down to three, two days a week and she got used to taking the money out. It was also a matter of not only no paycheck, but like that money's going to go down. But when she saw how the system worked, she eased into it and she was, you know, within a couple of years, she was dancing out of her job. Wow. So it was a, it was a weaning off of work. <laughs> That's well said. That's I so think cool. that needs to be an article for me to write. So thanks. Weaning, weaning <laughs> off of work. And what, one of the, and this is actually one of the, the, the worst, I would say it's a, not a well-named phase. Uh, I've written about this, but there's this, again, the kind of the, the prevailing thought, if you're not thinking much, we, do, we just think Americans think of retirement as kind of black and white. It's like you work and then you stop. And yes, that obviously happens for a lot of people. But the reality is there is this weaning process. There mm -hmm. is this landing the plane. You can think of it that way. Or I, I came up with this, what I, I call the retirement gray zone, where it's not black or white. And, it, and, it, and it, for a variety of reasons, you do want to work for a couple days a week. Or maybe you do need... Mm -hmm. You don't need your full amount. You're making two hundred thousand a year, and it's okay. Well, you know, really, would help this overall plan if you made forty or fifty, and that mm -hmm. and that would delay you having to take Social Security. So your Social Security goes up, and it would still it would really make this plan work a lot better if you did a year or two or three of kind of this retirement gray zone. So I, I think that's what we're talking about. I just never, I, I never love the name of the retirement gray zone because it just yeah. sounds like dark and you, dingy. You know what I like to to call it is staging retirement. So staging. it's like a three act play. Mm. Retirement isn't a deadline that everything stops. And it's really important for a lot of people to continue to work because it gives them purpose. And, pa and it's their passion and whatever. That's a different issue than some people who just are afraid not to have a paycheck. But it it's that transition time in there because I there's an assignment I give a lot gave a lot of my clients before they retired, go practice retirement. And they'd look at me and go, What? I go, when's the last time you took a two or three week vacation? Or have you gone and lived somewhere for a month where you think you might want to live in retirement? Practice retirement. That's a now that's another good article title. You probably have you written that I article? I have written about it for sure. But, but I did you call you, you need it. to write that article? Yeah, yeah. I think it's time to re-up practice retirement. I'd love for somebody to tell me to go on a three-week vacation. I right. love that. Because really people don't know what to do with themselves if they've been on a different routine and they have to practice it. The other big one, Wes, and you've probably seen it, people tell me they want to travel in retirement and I ask where, and they say, oh, we want to go to Europe and we're thinking of China. And, and I'm like, oh, so where have you been in the past 10 years? Oh, well, we rent a house on the, on the shore for two weeks. And I'm like, <laughs> go travel somewhere right now because if you, you might not even like it. Not to mention, you know, how 
it, the older you get, the harder it gets. But like, go check it out. Don't say yeah. that's what you're going to do and never having done it. I think you're that does happen a lot because there's this this mystique that travel is great. And then you go to 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 Italy and you think, well, Italy is perfect. It's gorgeous. It's amazing. And then you end up in Rome and there are 17 million people <laughs> in the piazza, which are the, the square that's supposed to be romantic, but it's that's jam packed like a stadium. And it's 96 degrees and you can't get gelato. And you're like, well, I would just rather be on the shore, as you said it, in Rhode Island than right. be here in this magical Exactly. Lala, Palooza. You don't really know. This gets back to creating money piece. The name of my business is you don't really know what your values and what really where you want your money to go unless you've tried different things. All right. What is the ultimate before we talk about the sandwich generation, which I know you speak yes. on a lot about yep. what's what's the ultimate money piece to you is when you know what your values are. And you feel good about spending money where you're spending money. Because we all have to spend money. So it's not just about investing and saving. You want to be investing in what you believe in. But if you can every day say, hey, I spent that $200 on that and it feels good. Or I I went out of my way and went to a wedding in England or Colorado or wherever. And it was a really important thing for me to be there. So glad I did it then it's not about, oh my gosh, I'd have more in savings for this or I'd have less in savings for that. It's it's really key to just practice what you feel is important. Yeah, kind of practicing your money purpose. You yeah. know, the 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 mission of art, we have this on the wall outside of the studio. I'm I'm here in the office doing this podcast with you, but our mission is helping families find happiness in retirement. Yeah. That is that is our mission, and hopefully we're getting better. And this is not a a switch that was flipped. It's really more of a, this gradual. And we I, I, we're trying to improve this is to try to figure out how to to really get people to define their money purpose and or their overall purpose. And you know, we so we have come up with our own questionnaires and we've come up with our own tools. Uh, because I've written a lot about it in these books, what the happiest retirees know, et cetera. But do you, did you ever use any, did you use any software, any tools to do this? Or was this the software of Christine Moriarty that just the, the human AI of you that would sit down and pull this out? Thank you. I love that expression, the human AI of me. I, I did use mostly my own software in my head because I thought it was very important to look people in the eye and talk to them about it. Mm. I did have forms to have people fill out that was a merging of a lot of personal growth work I have done over the years to create this business and create my life that I live in Vermont where I want to live. I do what I want to do that I had to go through steps. And so I apply them to individuals. By the way, I feel like I'm almost talking to someone from another country the, because you're from Vermont. What What is it like? There's only like a few people that live in Vermont. Well, what, what, is, what is it like? What is Vermont like? What do y'all do up there? Do you live in the woods? That's I literally picture you in, in, in the woods. There's nobody else around. You see people in the little town once in a while and you eat Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And that's like, that's what I hear and think of as and Vermont, which is wonderful. We go to the general store. That's where we see people in our small town. Is so that for real? Yeah. My town oh. has about 1,600 people, maybe less. I, You can live on, there's people who live on 40 acres here. We live on five acres. So I do go for a walk and see neighbors. Yeah. But I live on a dirt road, so my car is always dirty. I am. I have two windows in my office in two different directions. I see trees. Do you have a Subaru? Um, no, not at the moment. Gosh. But I have all-wheel drive. And then there's a river in our backyard. So what do we do? We go hiking. We go ski. I am closer to skiing than to any population center. So I go. Oh, like, is, is it Killington? Right? Like, how oh, far Killington's is Killington? Killington's in the south. And I live in central Vermont on the edge of the Green Mountains. So I can walk to the Green Mountains in three miles. I can 
go to Mad River Glen and I'm there. It's only 12 miles away. And the, what and what about, aren't the White Mountains also in Vermont? The White Mountains, I'm happy you asked the question so I could educate all your listeners, are in New Hampshire. So oh, don't New get Hampshire. lost. You go to the White Mountains in New Hampshire and the Green Mountains in Vermont. And uh. the rural areas of Vermont are quite rural. There's some small towns and then there's the largest town in the state is about 60,000 people of Burlington, and that has a a county called Chittenden County, and that's more similar to a suburb or a city. But the rest of Vermont is rural and green and just beautiful to drive around. The mountains are incredible. The views are incredible. I still am happy driving around here um, almost 30 years later. All right. Well, sorry to, to detour oh, no down problem. to the woods, to the you, Green Mountains. I'm just fascinated by it. Well, Vermont. I'm happy. It is like another country. The Okay. So let's, let's switch over to this. So, so sandwich generation, sandwich generation. I'm in it. Uh, my, you know, my parents are in their early seventies, but the, as I, I think about my clients who are 55 and now they're clear, uh, the, the, or the, the families I work with, and they're 55, and that means their parents are 80, mm. 75, et cetera. The, I, I looked this up. This, this, to, this came from the National Library of Medicine. It was a study. The risk of developing dementia. And I wanted to see a bell curve of when people get dementia on average most of the time. And I guess the average age for onset is 83, 84. But then again, I see this happen so much earlier. For, for so many people or for a fair amount of people. And it's uh, it's obviously a, a huge, huge problem. Oh, it, it's huge. Now, the problem is how are you going to define dementia? 50% uh, of people over 80 have some kind of memory or cognitive issues. However, with that in mind, there is um, a study that's shown that 99% of people with mild cognitive impairment have not been diagnosed by their doctor. Physicians aren't trained in this. And mild cognitive impairment happens long before dementia. What dementia does that mean? Is it, is it because it's just, is it hard to, to define, oh, I'm, I'm a little forgetful? It, it there's some real differences in I'm a little forgetful or I have some age related like I walk into the room the big joke I walk into the room I forget why I walked in like some of that's just normal aging so you have to separate out what's normal aging from what could be a real issue and I I, I have some, some great friends who are doctors there's a lot for them to know but memory stuff is very specific. And you really need someone with you to get it diagnosed. So I was blessed enough to take my mom to Mass General for um, to the memory center. And most net large institutions have them. And they would only let you come with someone who filled out all the form. So mm -hmm. the other thing about it is memory loss can come from depression. It can come from not drinking enough water vitamin B deficiencies. It, there is a host of reasons why some someone's memory might be off, especially as we age, no one else might be living with them, or it might just be another older person. It could be lack of engagement. So you have to rule out a lot of things before you can actually say there's dementia. And there has to be um, a professional involved. But mild cognitive impairment is the start of other dementias, but not all the time. So it could progress and it might not, depending. Is it the beginning signs of Alzheimer's? Is it the beginning si signs of Lewy body disease or Parkinson's? Or is it just nothing that we can fix it and treat it? And it, we always look to the older people and the elderly. However, there is early onset dementia. Mm -hmm. And there's early and, and Earl, er, anything but pre seventy is considered early. Yeah, but thirty five years old, people can get Alzheimer's and start with early onset Alzheimer's. If 
you, Parkinson's has some dementia components, and we can look at Michael J. Fox. Is yeah. something we all know who got Parkinson's young. They, there isn't a guarantee if someone has some kind of memory loss that it's going to progress. However, we have have to be attuned to it. And there's all sorts of symptoms um, of memory loss that people don't pick up unless you're with them on a regular basis. Okay. So, so the, what the, what happens most, let's mm-hmm. say, the where you have either husband and wife are living in a house and their kids are far away and they don't catch it and nobody wants to say, hey, I think I've got memory loss. Right. right. Then there then there are the, let's say, you've got a, adult kids that are checking in a lot and they're maybe a little more on top of it. Hey, mom or dad, you, you're starting to, I'm starting to really see some signs if, if let's say mom and or dad are agreeable to go to a memory center before we do even do that, or let's say in coinciding with that, what do we need to do financially to prepare ourselves? Well, I think long before that, that financial preparation is something we already tell clients is make sure your legal documents are up to speed. So that's a number one, because then someone can handle it. And more and more um, professionals and lawyers are recommending that you get guardianship as part of those documents, because it saves time going to court. And it is a different issue if there is severe memory loss. Explain to our listeners what guardianship really means. Guardianship is a tool of the state that can only happen typically in court, when the judge says so and so is the guardian for physical, mental, um, financial, all their needs, and then they, the one person is typically in charge of taking care of that person. It's Which a, is now? Would you so is the guardianship then, in your opinion, that supersedes a power of attorney? It, or, yeah, it it would it would. Um, like it's a more robust version. I, I know one thing that our that families that I work with will do is they'll have a financial power of attorney, and again, and to some extent that well, that is a legal document, but then it can also be added to let's say a Schwab account, a Fidelity account, and then some, my son can make decisions if some all of a sudden I slide into something of, of an issue. What so do you think power, about that strategy? Power of attorney. Well, that's part of the original legal documents. The guardianship would be in addition if I am cognitively impaired and problematic because there could be ways around it. You need the medical power of attorney and you need a financial power of attorney across the board. A lot of lawyers are adding the guardianship so that if I need a guardian, power of attorney can act whenever, whether you spring in or, or do otherwise. So that's one step. The second step is, and you mentioned your son, is... Have someone, I don't want to call it oversee, but see those accounts once a year or more frequently. Is something different happening in Schwab? It, you know, it, back in the old days, I was doing this for my parents. And so they didn't care about being online. So I would just go online, look at their bank accounts every couple of months, make sure nothing was major or an issue. So having another set of eyes on financial things is very helpful mm. for a family. Number three, and it sounds like you're doing it already with families, is make sure the family knows who the financial person is. And I don't just mean your investment advisor. I mean your banker, because I have a good friend who's um, a, manages a bank, and she says, you keep saying that financial planners know first about someone's financials, their cognitive capabilities going down, we know. Because if someone has always balanced their checkbook, taken good care, and now they're bouncing checks, that's the first sign that something's going on. So get to know their financial team and then fill out the forms, fill out the incapacity forms. I had one for my business for all my clients all my clients, I didn't say, hey, you're over 70, fill this out, saying, if I see some changes, who can I talk to? 
And yeah. it's becoming pretty um, just in the past four or five years that Vanguard, Schwab, Fidelity are requiring those. However, I've actually seen advisors say, oh, you don't have to bother with that. You have a power of attorney. It's a whole different issue. It's who can the investment person notify? Because if they can't necessarily notify the power of attorney if you haven't given them permission or if there's a medical issue or if you don't show up for a meeting or you're getting lost on the way to a meeting that you have gone to the same place dozens of times. Yeah. So those are all really practical steps. And, and right. I think it really starts with having a relationship with a some sort of estate planning attorney or would you say estate planning or elder care or kind of really I both both both, both kinds well, I I it depends on the estate the elder care attorney. I think a regular estate planning attorney can do the trick. Yeah. Uh, I think there's good estate planning attorneys out there that I trust inherently and there can be some good and bad elder attorneys out there. Yeah. So Depends it's really, what you, you need You need this backup chain of command is what, is what someone needs. You need the backup chain of command, but you also, whether you're the financial professional or the family member or the client, you want to have a team that knows each other. It's not like you have to meet them every single year or six months. It's just so if I pick up the phone as a financial planner and call their attorney, the attorney's like, great, I can talk to you, you know? Do, do you permission. have any stories? Not, not that we want to scare people, but do you have story any any examples or stories where kind of estate planning, power of attorney goes wrong or doesn't get done, and what can happen? Well, it it can go wrong for a couple of reasons. Is if a financial institution, and I'm I don't want to pick on one, but a lot of the financial institutions want their own power of attorney in place. And the Uniform Power of Attorney Code allows for a standard uh, power of attorney, this is the financial side, that every institution has to accept. There's a few states that hasn't passed it, but there's a standard power of attorney that every institution has to affect. I had a client who had her documents up to speed, everything was perfect. Her daughter was in charge because her daughter was a numbers person. Her son, who ran into some financial issues and a divorce, was living with her. And one of the financial institutions that shall not be named okay, fair. Sent, that sent her a form to fill out for power of attorney. He was there. Well, hold on, hold on. Even though she already had one. Oh, yeah. Because they don't accept... They didn't want to accept hers. So they're like, oh, just fill out our power of attorney. Mm. And so we know her son lived with her. He he saw the form. He filled it out with his he name on it. And he became financial power of attorney. For that account. Not mm. for everything, but for that account. And so it can go astray if there's too many hands in the in the mix. So that's why I think it's really important to make sure that advisors, individuals know about the uniform power of attorney code and that we have one for every family rather than one with every financial institution because updating them can be problematic. And and what happens to and I've heard I've heard of this happening where let's say you do let's say somebody who does end up they have an account at again we'll say XYZ company uh, uh, and they have an account and they run into uh, cognitive cognitive issues and the institution finds out about it mm -hmm. and whether they're, they have irregular spending patterns or something happens or they're on the phone and they're asking the same question every day for a month or so, something mm -hmm. that where it's a big red flag. Can't the institutions then create some next step for that family without them wanting that to happen without or, the client wanting them to happen. Yeah. Let's just, let's just say that you've got oh, someone who only if they have an incapacity form filled out, technically they can't call anyone else. It's not legal to reveal other people's financial information. 
Can um, they take that account to the courts, though, and get a conservatorship for someone? I don't think they – well, they could request it. So rather than say let they're going to get it, they could request it. And that could bring a lot of attention to the family and the friends and everything. That's why I like the lawyer, the financial people all knowing and talking to each other. Maybe you just have one meeting. And it's good for 10 years because you know who yeah. their team is. As long as you just know who the team is. Yeah, because if you know who their child is, even, that's great. You know, I used to have some clients say, oh, your kids are coming in at Christmas time for the holidays. Do you think we could set up a meeting for an hour so I get to meet your kids? And then I had people to reach out to. When something happened. When something happens. If you've never met them. You don't know, you don't have any idea. And even if you have a form, they might not know about the form when you call them. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a, I just think it's such a good, it's a practical, you know, if it, when you're in your thirties, you just don't think about this. You you, mm -hmm. you just, it's too far away. Of course I'm fine. You're not worried about dementia. But when you now all of a sudden are in your forties and then fifties, then you really have to start worrying about your parents and the reality here is, I, I guess my message to our Retire Sooner audience, it would be that getting a family estate planning attorney, whether you have a, mm -hmm. is really just a, such a great, important step because then it kind of break, it gets the documents done and it brings the family together. Now, I'm not saying it all goes smoothly and there's arguments between which, right, who's the responsible one and who has behavior and families and. But it's still so much better than not having anything in place. Absolutely, and, and it doesn't doesn't cost a fortune. It does. It's a, you don't have to go yeah. spend twenty thousand dollars. And to it's do an a lot plan. less expensive than going to court. Yeah, it's a great. And point. the the thing is, with a plan in place, you can at least put your wishes down on paper, and you have some choice. Sadly, only forty five percent of the people over 50 have a will. And I think that number needs to be 100% for everyone over 21. Yeah, it does. It does. Well, uh, with, with that, we've got, we've, we've already, we've already hit an hour. So I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to wrap this up I here I could today. go on about how else to protect your finances from freezing your credit report to. Give, give me that. Give, give me, we'll do lightning round. Give me your top three or five. Freeze Tips. your credit yes. report. Yeah. Okay. It's something we didn't talk about already. Probably good for a lot of people because that's what happens. Cancel the direct mail for yourself, for anyone over 80. They love direct mailing older people, whether email, phone calls, and asking for money. And then stay involved. If you're a child or a financial person, be willing to say, hey, let's see what checks you've written in the past four months. Because if they are writing the same amount to charity every single month, something's going on. They might. Mm -hmm. I had one client who wrote thank, who would re get a thank you note for sending $250 to ABC charity. And then she thought it was a bill and she'd send $250. And that's how we caught some things. Whoa. So those are my what is, three. What is, what is this cancel direct mail? Oh, you you can go to I I got the phone number right here. Um you can do do not call. It's 1-888-382-1222. There's a do not call.gov and there's a do not mail.gov. So No, kid, that, I didn't know there was a do not mail. Yeah, direct mail and they know when you're well, trust me. I know they know when you're over 60 because they keep sending hearing aid marketing Ads, to me. Marketing. Right. So they know if you're Wait, over... you're over 60? <laughs> I shouldn't have said anything. And thank you. I like you. And then if you're over 70, they'll start sending you something. Here was my favorite. I had a neighbor, thank God, who was a friend. They kept sending her Social Security. Social Security's going to run out they're going to cancel it unless you send us money so Hol scammers too scammers, scammers. Yeah. oh th that's the direct mail scammers so get anyone and everyone over 60 <laughs> on the um 
do not call list, do not mail list, cancel that. Less information coming in, the less app they're going to get something. I love that. Our top three financial ways to protect yourself while the sky is still blue. It, correct. And anyone can do it themselves. They don't need a professional to do those three. I, I knew it was going to be fun talking to you because you're, you, you kind of, you have this, you've done, you've been an advisor for, you did, you were an advisor for a couple, several decades. Now you speak about this helping advisors in a, in a really what's a tricky situation for more and more and more families. And almost everybody, almost everybody at some point in the family will go through this. And that's why I think it's so important that we, that we talk to you. So thank you for your insights here today. It's it's been really fun to chat. This has been a pleasure, Wes. Thank you so much. And I hope we can do it again sometime. I love your podcast. Thank you. God bless. She's smart to say that. That's all you have to say. I love your podcast.